OC World is made possible by the generous contributions of Marisla Foundation, Keith and Judy Swain Family Foundation, Wells Fargo Bank, the University of California, Irvine, Orange County Community Foundation, Cordoba Corporation, Farmers and Merchants Bank, and viewers like you. Thank you. It could be argued that Will and Carrie Singleton found their legacy project when they launched a million stories to the world, one story at a time. Their story began roughly five years ago with the Singleton Foundation for Financial Literacy and Entrepreneurship, a digital media platform of storytelling with easily accessible financial tools and learning resources. It's a narrative that has led this husband-wife team to the challenging mission of trying to help Americans achieve financial competency, primarily through gaming, apps, and online video programming. To date, the Foundation's content has reached more than 200 million viewers. Why do you, the two of you have such a desire to educate the public about financial competence. What is it in your backgrounds or your thinking that traveled down this path? I get it, it was a legacy statement you made, but a statement that's led to where you are today is a long road. And what, what's sort of the motivation behind it? When Carrie and I first began to talk about what we wanted to do as a legacy project, we, uh, we talked about our our interests and our goals and what we could do that would actually make a difference. And her uh, main interest turned out to be entrepreneurship, nurturing of entrepreneurship. And mine was uh, simply uh, the lack of uh, basic financial literacy skills because they just don't teach that. It's not a, uh, it doesn't seem to uh, resonate with the educational community. And it's a huge issue, in my opinion, if, if folks can't manage money. The risk that we've decided to take at the Singleton Foundation is to break the taboo. Break the taboo about talking about money, and we're going to use entertainment to do it. But it's a risk we think is worth taking because it affects every one of us. It's the economic future of our country and of our world. It's interesting to me, you don't hear couples, a lot of couples talking about what's your legacy or what do I want our, what do we want our legacy to be? And that's really unusual, but it's really a, a genuinely heartfelt position one could ask themselves. Maybe, is there any advice you would offer others to kind of explore that side of their relationship or their personality as well? I think one of the things is, is that people assume that they can't really do philanthropy until they're in their 50s or 60s or almost retired. And I think that that is uh, something that we need to change. Uh, I was fortunate to have a mentor right out of college who immediately put me on boards in the community of Tucson. And uh, we also started the Children's Museum there. And nobody said you can't do that because you're 20 years old. And she was 67. And we went out to breakfast every week and talked about what else we were going to do in the community. We, we raised money for cancer and all sorts of things. And ever since then, I have felt very strongly that it behooves all of us to think about who could we mentor, whether we ever call it that name or not. And I, none of my mentors ever were called mentor. But they completely changed the way I thought about not waiting until I was 50 or 60 to do something philanthropically. So when I met Will, it, to say the legacy project, it was really more a question of which of all the things I care about do I want to be involved in. And I think focusing, which is kind of the idea of a legacy, focusing on something where you really can make a difference more than just financially, um, for us has been a very exciting um, project. We've met a lot of fantastic people. That's right, and by combining our two approaches, I think it becomes more powerful. We can use the power of entertainment in a fun way, combine both uh, the ideas of entrepreneurship and uh, basic financial concepts. 
Why do you suppose there's such a need for financial competence programming and initiatives? The, the fact that there's a need is interesting because pretty much it hasn't been taught in the schools and when there is, when it is taught in the schools, it's usually something very boring like accounting, you know, what's on the left column and what's on the right column. And parents don't talk to their kids about money. And I didn't realize, because I don't have children of my own, that that is common no matter where you are in society financially. Uh, most young people don't know anything about uh, credit scores or debt or how to finance something, I, all the things that that in my family we were taught, but I just, it turns out that's very unusual. And we started this with the idea of looking at millennials and Gen Zs, but one of the things we discovered pretty quickly was almost everybody can use our stuff. I know people in their 60s and 70s who realized they don't know if they have enough money to retire. And with a, just a little bit of change in their life, they could retire. They just have assumed, I guess I'll just never be able to retire. And we'd like to see that changed. You mentioned earlier also about the value. How many years has the foundation been in existence? About uh, five years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, sort of a, if you did an overview of the last five years, if you put your 2023, you know, you know, report together on the last five years, can you kind of define for me how it's going? Funny you should ask. We just uh, developed a report uh, which uh, addresses those uh, topics and. You know, it could be better. It's not easy. There are a lot of people in this space. There are banks, universities, other institutions that have financial literacy programs. Um, so I can't really speak to whether they work well or not. I'm sure that people who take advantage of those tools uh, improve and, and learn some things. But we felt that uh, using the power of entertainment to really engage, especially young people, um, would make uh, talking about money and uh, thinking about money and how it's used, that it would, it would make it cool. You know? And obviously it's very difficult to reach everybody, but as Carrie says, we've uh, made a tremendous amount of progress. We've had in all of our programs, approximately 200 million engagements. Those are views, completed views. There are people playing our games, uh, people using our programs like Slingshot and Groove. Um, so I believe, I believe we're on the right track. The Singleton Foundation has multiple projects, apps and games in the digital space that it has produced over the last several years, including Million Stories, Slingshot, Venture Valley, Faceplant and others all geared for the financial competency market. I was fascinated by Singleton Inc. Can you explain that to me? Well, Singleton Inc., the idea is that if you don't ink a story, as in write it down, then it may or may not get passed on to other people. So the idea for me is that I'm a storyteller, and I believe that stories are how people remember and actually potentially change. If they're inspired by a story, it may inspire them to go ahead and do something else. If they're inspired uh, by the word legacy, for example, I've had several people write me emails who've heard me talk about legacy projects and say, I had never thought about this before, but now I'm working on my legacy project. And it, many of these people are in their 20s and 30s. And to me, that's the reason that Singleton Inc. exists. Uh, I obviously still hope to get something up on the screen someday, but in the meantime, we've uh, been able to use the ideas that I learned in cinema school and storytelling and how important it is to have visual reference, to have comedy, um, to sometimes have something that's kind of sad, a, a face plant, and then realize you can get through it with help. And at the end of the day, that's what storytelling is. We're here in Orange County, clearly, and uh, you, you have some interest here. You, you live part-time here and elsewhere, from my understanding. Can you tell me a little bit about what the Singleton Foundation's interests are in and around Orange County? Well, we're working with uh, several of the local nonprofits, for example, the Rescue Mission. Um, we're hoping to have our tools be available to them. That's an 18-month program, I believe. Uh, Habitat for Humanity is another program that's going to have an event here. Uh, one of the 
programs I think is really exciting uh, is the wooden floor. And the reason I think it's exciting is that the wooden floor takes at-risk uh, students and through dance, they learn confidence, which goes very much along with what we're trying to do, confidence and confidence. And then, so that we, when we got the event space, I said to Don Reese, who's the um, CEO over there, I said, what if we did American dances from each decade and your kids were costumed and danced as we brought out each decade's cars and then drove them off and brought out the next decade's cars and I think that would be just a wonderful way to show what we are doing as a foundation, show what these beautiful cars can do, and show what the wooden floor is doing because they have a 100% graduation rate and acceptance into college, which is just amazing, I think. Additionally, uh, to the ones that Carrie's mentioned, we're working on uh, future collaborations with the Orange County Community Foundation, which is a, uh, a very worthwhile organization here supports all types of uh, philanthropies. What's your hope for the future of Singleton Foundation? Well, the future of Singleton Foundation is uh, dependent quite a bit on how we perform. And then if we perform well and we can show results, then we will get partnerships, uh, meaningful partnerships we hope to uh, We've, we've had a few, Carrie mentioned Experian, uh, they sponsored a couple of our shows. Um, uh, we have partnerships with the military and other organizations. We, uh, we hope to continue developing those partnerships and if people realize that we're doing significantly good work and that people are responding, then they eventually will come. But um, we want the foundation to continue to grow and to hopefully outlive us. We're in, you know, your your car museum here in Newport Beach, or Costa Mesa, I guess this is. Do you remember your first cars? Well, my first car was a 67 Bug. It was a pumpkin color, 1500 cc engine and I drove it a little bit too fast. But uh, that was, uh, you know, when you're 16 years old, you tend to do that. My first car was a 1971 Monte Carlo that was gold. And uh, it was kind of fancy for a 16 year old. My mother taught me how to drive in one week. I had just been living overseas, came back, taught me to drive in one week and gave me the car so that I would run errands for the family in a safe car because we were not allowed to drive in a VW bug. Have you driven most of these cars? I think I've driven every, every one and carries uh, accompanied me on most of them. Um, there might be one or two I haven't, got, haven't quite gotten to yet. We just picked up a couple of cars last week and one of them was the Chrysler 300F 1960. Haven't driven that yet, but apparently it's a, it's a driver. The development of the American automobile is an expansive story, but through discovery and experience, the Singletons landed on specific parameters for its collection. Innovation, historical significance, advancement of automotive design and style, originality, and provenance. Housed in a 45,000 square foot building in Costa Mesa and spanning seven decades from the early 1900s to the 1970s, Will and Carrie Singleton plan to create a space where their collection can be shared and enjoyed by the community. Through their involvement in the collector's car world, the Singletons have been able to find a parallel universe that connects to a passion of theirs, the promotion of entrepreneurship and how the story of the American automobile relates to benchmarks of innovation. Uh, Duesenberg represents kind of the epitome of the American automobile in the 1930s. Uh, these were cars that were special from day one when they were built. Uh, this Duesenberg is wearing one-off coachwork. This is the only Duesenberg Model J that was produced by Rolston in this configuration with the disappearing top. In addition to the provenance behind the car, it also represents uh, a few different things that we try to focus on when we have a car come into the collection, which is not only mechanical advancement, uh, 
design and style advancement, but also uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, and really the the pinnacle automobiles that uh, stand at the at the top. The next car we're going to go over is our 1937 uh, Cord Sportsman 812, uh, also commonly referred to as the Coffin Nose Cord. And there are a few reasons why this car took on such a design. Uh, partially was because of the designer that made the car, Gordon Burig, and the other reason was uh, due to the front wheel drive aspect of this car. If you look up front, you'll see a rather unconventional style in the front for the uh, transmission that's housed up there. Uh, that was a really innovative feature for Cord in uh, 1929 when they started producing the L29, and it stayed uh, through the automobile production for the company up into the 30s. Uh, along with that transmission, it also has a pre-select, which is a unit in here off the steering column that electronically controls the transmission. This was far ahead of its time for the 1930s, especially on an American automobile. This was something that we saw much more in Europe. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll just interject here that uh... It's the strangest uh, transmission I've ever <laughs> had to use. You actually have to, uh, say you're going from first to second, you have to first pre-select second, then you have to operate the clutch, which then activates a solenoid and accomplishes the, uh, the shift. So it's kind of like a semi-automatic. You know, you just didn't see cars like this in the 30s, uh, very low. Uh, front wheel drive, uh, pre-select transmission, supercharged. It was uh, quite the car for the time period. So with this being a front wheel drive car, there's quite a few differences underneath the hood. So one of the biggest features on this car would be the side pipes. It's really prominent and it catches the eye. And any cord with side pipes more or less means that it's uh, a supercharged example. When Cord decided to do a front-wheel drive car for this, uh, for this model, the A12, that means having the transmission in the front. So it's actually housed forward of the radiator, and that's why we have that electronic shifting to be able to control something all the way up here, uh, not, being, not using linkages, but being able to use it with the, the pre-select transmission. And then lastly, on top, you see this supercharger here. Uh, it's a very advanced technology for the day, and it's uh, really a sign of a car that was, you know, rather expensive and rather significant when it was new. This 62 Ghia is one of a few cars we have that are unrestored, and that's become a growing trend here. It's really harder and harder to find in the collector car world, uh, a car of a significant age that's never been repainted, never been taken apart, never had to have the engine rebuilt or replaced. It stood the test of time, and it still you know, presents exactly the way it did when it was new, maybe with some, some patina and stories to tell with age. Uh, this car specifically is a 1962 Ghia L6.4, and this was a very limited production automobile. It's a Chrysler drivetrain, you know, Mopar chassis, uh, but it has Italian coachwork, although it was still built for the American market. It's the second iteration of the automobile put out by the Dual Motors Corporation. And uh, being the fact that it has this Italian coachwork, an American drivetrain, final assembly here in the United States, it uh, resulted in not very many of them being built. And they cost quite a bit of money when they were new. This specific example was the New York City show car for 1962. If you look at the inside of this car, uh, it starts to really resonate how original it is. The leather shows age, the carpet has some wear spots, and uh, truly one of the things that draws us to this car, it's, it's one of the best cars in the collection that represents taking risk with design and style and, and what was happening in the 1960s. I mean, if it weren't for the wheels and tires on this car, it would look like a jet. The unrestored car, regardless of its condition, has an advantage over restored cars. Uh, to certain people. One of those advantages is that they're not making them anymore. You get an unrestored car, you're seeing exactly what it looked like when it was uh, produced. Uh, parts haven't been changed, 
Um, and uh, for example, this car is a 1957 Ghia, but uh, a dual motors uh, Ghia, by the way. But it's been completely gone over and restored. It's been restored to original standard. But this car has 33,000 original miles on it. Never been apart, like Matt said. And it drives as it would have basically in 1962. Uh, this specific simplex was bought new by Harold Vanderbilt. And it was alleged to be an engagement gift to a woman named Eleonora Sears, who was uh, from a Boston socialite family and also one of America's most famous athletes of the time. And from 12 to 14, there was rumors through the newspapers and tabloids that they were going to get married, but it never did happen. Uh, but what did happen was that Elio uh, kept this car and drove this car up until the late 1930s. Uh, and that's when it entered into the world of collectability. Future plans for the Singletons include fully building out their collection over the next several years with each car's history, design, and style to be fully accessible and articulated, along with a few road trips to such locations as Pebble Beach. So we drove our 1912 Simplex at Pebble Beach this year, and that's a 50 or 60 mile drive with hundreds if not thousands of people holding their cameras up and uh, I've learned how to do a parade wave. You didn't learn, you just were... <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It, it was really interesting though because it was very cold, we had no windshield on our car and, uh, and uh, our car, car collection manager was in the back and we were all dressed for the period and so that brought even more cameras out when they saw us and uh, we, as we went along, we kept thinking, what happens if we break down? Because we were seeing cars a lot younger than us that were pulled off the side of the road, tow trucks, tow trucks coming along, and, uh, but we didn't break down. We, we made the whole 50-mile trip without uh, anything other than freezing. I gotta believe as a couple or any couple going through an experience of driving a car up to Pebble Beach and dressed for the time period and having the camera, that's gotta be a great experience. It's a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, just being on the lawn at Pebble Beach, being accepted to show the car was a tremendous experience. And the people up there are just wonderful, the best car people in the world. And that car has a great story. And so the fact that we were dressed in period for the car prompted people to ask about the car and learn a lot about that car, which was really wonderful. My first experience with this car was trying to figure out which each dial and switch and lever and all of these things did because all of this is different more or less from a modern car. And so I took a few lessons and, uh, and pretty soon I felt comfortable with it. Um, and then uh, so Carrie and I met up at uh, Pebble Beach and they have a very early morning gathering where all of the cars that are going to take the tour, they go from Pebble Beach down to Big Sur and back. They gather around 7 o'clock in the morning and they take off around 9 o'clock. And I was nervous. I was a little nervous because, you know, there's all these different cars and I didn't want to stall the car or run into somebody or anything. Uh, but as Matt was saying, these cars are eminently drivable. They were extremely uh, well engineered at the time and this one has been restored so that it uh, drives just about well it drives actually better than it did when it was new so uh, so we had a great time other than the fact that uh, it was a little cold there's no windshield we had our goggles and our helmets and everything on although driving down there all the all the photographers and the people along the streets really loved it the car got a, a very great reception what are you doing my parade wave oh your parade wave <laughs> oh and let's see if i can remember how to start it oh my gosh yeah okay i gotta do this switch to battery switch on all right there. Uh -huh.